there is this chapter in your climbing where you made this really big leap from around 8B to 8C plus. So for mm. us Americans, 13D to 14C in about 18 months. Mm -hmm. And I, re I think I read that blog post probably half a dozen times just looking for <laughs> clues and secrets and really trying to understand uh, the details of what you were doing and how you were fingerboarding and all these things. Um, I was wondering if you could, for listeners, give a quick overview of of that chapter of your climbing and how that kind of progression came to be. And then I'll, uh, I have some questions I'd love to dive into with that. Yeah, sure. Well, I, I think, um, you know, thinking about that period in, in my climbing, um, there's two parts to it. I mean, one, there's the the part that's relevant to me, and then this part that I'd want other people to take away from it. So the part that was relevant to me was that um, I started doing some basic finger strength training on a fingerboard pretty regularly and consistently, um, and that allowed me to make a big jump in finger strength. So, th I mean, that, that gives the idea that fingerboarding is a very useful training tool. <laughs> that used to, when, when I've, at that time, which would have been the early 2000s, there weren't masses, like it wasn't nearly as common for people to use fingerboards. And especially now in 2020, mm -hmm. there's hardly anyone who isn't. Um, so that's not controversial. But um, the the kind of wider point is like, what should people take away from it? And, and I think that is relating to finding whatever your, your weak area is. Um, so looking at my background, I'd already spent a long apprenticeship doing all these different types of climbing um, and also on many different rock types and I'd also grown up in a climbing culture that very highly values technique so the way you climb something rather than um, just beasting your way up it looking very strong so you know people did say oh you look strong you know or you're climbing strongly People did say that, but not nearly as much as now. <laughs> People really valued someone who could climb something and make it look easy. Hmm. So it was like, if you could climb something without using your strength, that was that was kind of valued in the climbing culture that I grew up in. And I definitely carried that. So I think that meant that my climbing apprenticeship had given me a broad base of of awareness of movement technique and climbing and tactics. So I could really get the most out of my strength. So if you can imagine like per unit finger strength, <laughs> for every kilo of finger strength that I, I had, I could get a lot of mileage out of climbing difficulty from that, which meant that just pushing that by a little bit, a few more kilos, could, was enough to have a huge increase in mm. in my grade level. That might not be the same for someone else. <laughs> <laughs> um, if if someone else's either movement technique or their tactics are not so well developed, then they could increase their finger strength by a fair amount, and it would only have a fairly modest effect on their climbing standard. Um, so there's. There's lots of sort of layers for how to how to understand that, but basically, uh, what I did is I was I was fairly plateaued at around 13D red point level, um, and I could yeah I mean I could do that I could do that consistently and I could do it in on trad as well as on bolts, um, and I, I I became aware that it was a real plateau. I really really was stuck for the first time for a, a long time, like quite a few years really. Uh, so uh, the I understood that the the tactics I was using in my training to try and keep improving were were starting to reach a bit of a dead end. I'd milked them as far as I could go, and I wanted to uh, think about changing changing tack and trying something quite different. Well, two things. I mean. I, I changed to doing that most basic form of, of climbing training, which is just hanging from a piece of wood, <laughs> 20 mil edge, but also doing it on a very consistent basis. Um, and that really did have a marked effect. So I started doing that um, 
at the start of a summer. So it was like the end of the spring conditions here in Scotland where the time for hard red pointing was coming to an end and we were coming into the mountain trad season. But also the season where it's almost like off season training, uh, where it's too hot to really climb hard. Um, so we do trad in the mountains, but I'd also do a bit of basic training as well. Uh, and I, I started doing fingerboarding uh, about six days a week for about 30 minutes. And, you know, not, not great volume, 30 minutes total, including the warm up. So that's like a warm up and then a handful of sets per, per grip type. Um, and I just did that six days a week. And yeah, when I came back to my spring projects, when it got to the October, I was absolutely blown away by the, the increase in strength. It was, hmm. it was just fantastic. Um, but because I already had that, that base of technique, I could, I could just take that. It was probably only a few kilos more. Hmm. But it meant it meant a big difference for me because I could really leverage it because I'd already developed um, a reasonable base of technique. I'd love to hear how you think about the high intensity and high frequency low volume sessions versus um, what's advocated for more commonly now in the training space of you know one to two sessions per week, but longer duration, more sets, that sort of thing. Have you tried both? Do you do you have thoughts on? Um, yeah, do you have thoughts on that and how they affect the physiology of our fingers? Yeah, I mean, this is a tricky one because uh, where I like to start with any discussion of training and what works and what doesn't is with hard science. <laughs> but the problem is we don't have it <laughs> in climbing. <laughs> I, can't, I can't say, well, this study that compared all these different um, protocols for finger strength training had these different results. Those studies haven't been done. There have been a couple of small studies, but they're very small and they don't really test all the options. So really what you're going by is a mixture of applying knowledge of basic physiology, um, borrowing from other sports and personal experience. <laughs> and all of those are reasonably poor substitutes for for hard evidence, like a real trial of like, well, let's test the idea. Mm. Let's compare like a, a small amount of fingerboarding every day to a, a bigger session three times a week or two times a week or whatever. I suspect that if you did run that study, the differences would not be very dramatic. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> um, but I don't honestly know what those differences would be. So when whenever I read... Um, articles or listen to people talking about finger strength training i'm always curious to see like well where what's the what's the evidence where where is this coming from and mostly it comes from from experience um and so i i i have tried to think well okay well that's fine but i quite like to sort of test what happens if you do the opposite and i've done that in many aspects of my training and go well well i think this is true and it sort of makes sense and that's what people do but well, what happens if we do the opposite? Um, <laughs> when I've been observing um, sports, not just climbing, but also looking at other sports, I and mean, I've spent a bit of time studying sports science and, and looking at other sports, then one thing you kind of become aware of is that professional athletes train quite a lot and they tend to train every day. Um, and they may do like a a formal resistance session only a few times a week. But quite a lot of their other activities in the week, they really are still resistance training. They're still using their strength. So professional athletes train quite a lot and they seem to do okay with that. Um, so I thought, well, I, I'll, I'll sort of try training like that. So that was part of the experiment as well. Um, and it seemed to go well. <laughs> <laughs>